I don't forgive Germany what they did. Never, never, never forget. I don't think anybody who went through this forgot and forgave. I could have won this thing and they wouldn't let me compete. I could have won, but I didn't. In 1936, Margaret Bergman was the best female high jumper in Germany, the reigning national champion, the winner of the Olympic trials. Margaret Lambert, she was born Gretel Bergman in Germany. She was a world-class um, high jumper. She was one of the most gifted German athletes. She had the German record with one meter and 60 in high jump. She was athletic pretty much from childhood. She became a competitive athlete while in her teens, she equaled or bettered the German high jump record when she was just 16. Really, honestly, was probably one of the few Jews in, in Germany, anyway, who could qualify for the German Olympic team. She was one of the medal hopes of Germany for the 1936 Olympic Games. Of course, when she was 16, the Nazis hadn't taken power yet. And when that happened in 1933, everything changed quite radically. The odds she was up against as a Jewish athlete in Nazi Germany are quite a story. And here I am, 200, how old am I? <laughs> You're not 200 yet, 102. 202. No, 102. 102. <laughs> and it didn't kill me. political climate and the climate in the society, of course, was very, very difficult. It was the time of the Nazi regime. In aufrichtiger Kameradschaft begrüßt die Bewegung besonders die Vertreter der jetzt unter dem Befehl des Führers stehenden Wehrmacht. Sie sind Deutschland. Wenn Sie handeln, handelt die Nation. After Hitler took power, there was a period of time when uh, Nazi terror ruled. The big thing was the passage in September of 1935 of Nuremberg racial laws, and German Jews were really demoted to second-class citizens. What is very distinctive about Nazi Germany is that this is coming not only in individual communities at the grassroots, but you're seeing it from the very top. It's official, state-supported, state-developed policies. Everybody knows that people that belong to the Jewish community were followed by the Nazi regimes. They were threatened by death, and so were Jewish sportsmen and women. German Jewish athletes were basically kicked out of their sports. So what happened is that you had an exodus of certain athletes. There the history of Gretel Bergmann began. This was a time when, when Hitler had uh, promoted this idea of fighting the Jews, and Margaret was a very good athlete, and she was, as uh, those who know her, a very good personality, but she was a Jew. Ein Volk, das nicht auf die Reinheit seiner Rasse hält, geht zu Grunde. Hard from competing, my mother went to England to compete. Yes, I went to England because I couldn't do anything in Germany. Got to be a big shot there. <laughs> she was an uh, English champion. She even improved the German record or the record in England. They all liked me, and so 
Life was that bad in England, but we knew it couldn't last. The 1936 Olympics were, of course, very controversial. They're sometimes referred to and legitimately as the Nazi Olympics. Hitler was very assiduous about getting these Olympics because it would show, he, he felt Germany in a very good light. And so among other things they did was uh, try to clean up um, the, whatever anti-Semitism that they had. And uh, everything seemed to be like a normal country, like a normal, sophisticated country. But it was clear to a lot of people what Hitler was about uh, and what Germany was about, utter discrimination. The games were misused by the Nazi regime for propaganda, of course. We often find things like that, that uh, those regimes try to misuse big international events for their own ideas. And the same happened, of course, in Germany. Initially, the Nazi regime itself was very skeptical about whether they wanted to host these games. You know, the regime and Hitler himself, I think, became convinced uh, with the help of people like Joseph Goebbels, who was the Minister of Propaganda, that uh, this was a propaganda opportunity that could, could not be passed up. Möge die helle Flamme unserer Begeisterung niemals zum Erlöschen kommen. Sie allein gibt aus der schöpferischen Kunst einer modernen politischen Propaganda Licht und Wärme. When we had the uh, Berlin 36 Olympic Games, they were created and they were given to Germany at a time where we had a democratic system but they were, they were held when the system was turned over. They were all organized to the benefit of the Third Reich, of the Nazi system. It became quite clear that the Nazis wanted to make the Berlin Olympics a showcase for their philosophy, for their ideas about Aryan superiority. There was a significant movement uh, in the United States and you also find it in other Western countries, to boycott the, the Berlin Olympics. Well, this sort of traces the progression of my mother's story, and there were very progressive forces that were pushing for the boycott. An editorial from the New York Post advocating a boycott of the Olympics in Berlin. The Nazis, faced with the threat of either an Olympic boycott or the Olympics being canceled, had to do something to convince the world community that they were worthy of holding the Olympics, and they developed a rather elaborate charade of inclusion of Jewish athletes. The United States had threatened not to take part in the Olympics if Germany would not allow Jewish people to take part in. That was the threat. Margaret, she was living in uh, England. She was told that um, if she didn't come back and try out for the German uh, women's high jump team, uh, that uh, the German government would cause problems for her parents. She didn't really want to return to Germany under those conditions, but... The Germans made me come back because I was the only one who was able to compete in the Olympics. The token Jew. A toga too. She really had no choice but to return and was reinstated to the German national team. I think most scholars agree that it, it was a little bit of a setup. As soon as the American team sailed for Germany, my mother was promptly sent a letter lamenting the inconsistency of her performance and dismissing her from the German Olympic team. With a nice Heil Hitler at the bottom. The Germans could say, we tried to get a Jew to participate for Germany, but she just wasn't good enough. I mean, I'm, I'm sure that it was always intended for show. And, and was, they never, ever intended that she would be on that team. They didn't just fake her out, they faked the whole world out. They used her. It was incredibly elaborately contrived. 
Well, there are some stories about the relationship between a young woman called Dora Ratjen and Gretel Bergmann. Dora Ratjen was found by the Nazi regime just in order to kick Gretel off the team. Oh! <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, my roommate, Dora Ratjen, was a very interesting person. My mother's always told me that she had quite a cordial relationship with Dora, even though she had, if not suspicion, some confusion about just who Dora was. Dora was very secretive. Dora was given a separate room in which to shower and dress. I finally figured out what was going on. It was discovered that uh, Dora Ratchen was really Herman Ratchen, that she was, or he was, a man. But you never saw Dora's... Uh... I never saw her naked. And she went on to compete. Dora Ratchen, Deutschland. There's been so much speculation about whether Dora was a man or that Dora was gender ambiguous, but the fact is the Germans knew. Basically, a lot of historians believe that the Germans, you know, sacrificed the opportunity for a medal and very possibly a gold medal by not allowing Gretel Bergman to compete for them. There was nothing worse Hitler and his people could imagine but a German athlete of Jewish belief winning a gold medal for Germany. This was not allowed to happen. All I know is I could have won and they would let me compete, so. But they were hoping that Dora would win. Oh, yes. Who, who didn't win? Dora didn't win, no. <laughs> Well, I think Gretel was as disappointed as you can be after finding out what has happened to you. She started making plans to get out of Germany pretty much immediately. She had no sports future in Germany. They didn't want her. America in the 1930s, it was really the height of anti-Semitism in, in the U.S. as well. When Gretel Bergman, you know, arrived in the United States, she really wanted to break with Germany. I think she became Margaret rather than Gretel. She stopped speaking German. She learned English as quickly as she could, and you stopped speaking German. German was not spoken in the house when I was growing up. She really became an American. She assimilated almost instantly. So what happens when a lot of the German Jews, many of whom are quite well educated, arrive in the U.S. They have minimal English language skills, of course, typical immigrant story. So often they, they kind of have to start at a lower rung. But the thing about Margaret was she came and she competed in the high jump in the U.S. If there was an Olympic Games in 1940, Margaret would have been on the American team. She was then still um, the greatest uh, women high jumper in the world. And I started competing here, and I did very well. And I won the, the American Championship. She won the National uh, Women's Championship in the high jump before she retired to, to start a family, I think. No, 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 that's your husband. Here, can I get up? That's my husband after he came over, a year after I came over, he came over. And uh, we got married pretty fast. He was a good looking guy. My mother and father actually met in Germany. They did not immediately commence a relationship, but they became friendly. And then she had an occasion to meet my father in Frankfurt. She said the moment he stepped off the train in Frankfurt and they saw each other, something happened. <laughs> I met him and we fell in love immediately. He was the best, the very best person. Her husband was Bruno Lambert. He was a doctor. Uh, he was an internist. And on the very day that he became an American citizen, he went to the induction office and became a medical doctor in the United States Army. 
Bruno, such an open-minded personality, such a funny, nice man. I admired this couple. They were a couple of such a, such a spirit. I see that, that Bruno was really, really the highlight of her life. When did he die? Two years ago? Almost three, 2013, at a, the age of 103. Mm -hmm. And do you remember how long you were married? Four years. Seventy-five years. Huh? <laughs> Seventy-five years. Seventy-five years? Yeah. That's how I got my career. Absolutely. My parents always talked of the irony of them owing their lives, their marriage, their, their life together to Adolf Hitler. The fact that she came here and she made a great life for herself, my father made a great life for himself and his children in America, is certainly the silver lining and maybe the best revenge. This is an article that I did uh, for the New York Times prior to the Atlanta Olympics that were gonna be uh, several weeks later, titled, uh, An Olympic Invitation Comes 60 Years Late. The story starts, um, the envelope was postmarked Frankfurt, Germany. The letter to Margaret Bergman Lambert, 82, was written in English under the letterhead of Walter Troger, president. It is my honor and pleasure to inform you, the letter began, that the National Olympic Committee for Germany has decided to invite you to be our guest of honor during the Olympic Centennial Games in Atlanta. Who invited you to Atlanta? I was invited. Yes, but who? Do you remember who invited you? No. It was the German Olympic Committee. Big shot. Big shot. <laughs> I sent a letter to her, which read, Dear Margaret Lambert, I just learned about your fate and about what, what you have uh, suffered and what you have done. So I invited her as a, my guest, as a guest of the National Olympic Committee, together with her husband, to come to Atlanta to visit the Games. All right, for the moment, that's it from Olympic Stadium. Now back to Bob Costas. Okay, among those in attendance tonight for the women's high jump competition is Margaret Bergman, once a national champion in this event. She was at first reluctant because she harbored this resentment, understandable resentment about Germany. And then she thought about it and she said, I can't continue to resent Germany because it's a new generation. For her, it was a sign. Germany gives me the respect that didn't give me in former times. That sparked this sort of worldwide awareness of her. Ira Burkow of the New York Times saw her speak at an event on Long Island, and decided he just had to interview her. And so the story ran on uh, 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 A1 Sunday, New York Times front page. Not the front page of the sports section, but the front page of the paper. And the next day, the phone would not stop ringing. After that gesture from the German Olympic Committee in 1996, she decided she cannot hold subsequent generations responsible. So in 1999, she came to Germany. Uh, that is the result of my work over 70 years for many organizations and so on. That's from Buch. The book which Gretel Bergmann wrote, and which I had the pleasure to make the foreword. That's one of our meetings, myself and that's Margaret. And that's the christening of what you say of the way uh, after her name in Berlin, near the Olympic Stadium. A street right by the Olympic Stadium in Berlin, which I think was formerly named after a Nazi, is now Gretel Bergmann Weg. And this has been a, an ongoing process of reconciliation and the growing of true friendships with many, many people in Germany. I think reconciliation is, is a very good word. It's very hard to forget and, and forgive. Well, forgiving is a difficult expression. My personal feeling is she did not forgive and she can't forgive what has happened to her. But I'm convinced that she knows that today's Germany is a different Germany. She made the difference between the old Germany, she cannot, cannot forgive the old Germany and those people who were in charge of that, and the new Germany who, um, who changed their system. 
Germany today is a much different country and society than it was, and there have been educational efforts and uh, many memorialization efforts in Germany in many places. It's important for young people to know about Margaret's story because they can learn a lot. The after-war generation, of course, had to learn from the terrible experiences of the generations before. I don't hold it against the people who have shown me that they are not in the city anymore. I did enough in my life. I did all the physical stuff that I was able to do. Not bad for old. I am lady. I've learned from Margaret and from Bruno that you can be hurt and that you can overcome that, that you can even enjoy your life together with those people who are really friends with you. She is such an impressive lady. Don't forget how old she is. And she is so, so open-minded. She's a remarkable person. And she really is a model uh, in so many ways for us. I mean, she has such a positive spirit. I think of her as a woman with spine. Being a world-class athlete also gave her confidence and a strength. She knew who she was. I think of a, a great woman and a great friend. She's hilarious. She's a very funny person. She never lost a sense of humor. One of the things I admire most about her is she doesn't see herself as a victim. She continues to stand up for victims. You know, she really hates injustice of all kinds and I think my mom knows this already, but she's my hero. She and my dad are both my heroes. The greatest heroes I could possibly imagine were always under this roof. I'm proud that I was able to show the Nazi Germans what a true could do. It was quite a story.